Good afternoon. Welcome back uh, to Forum. And uh, I'm really extremely excited. I mean, I'm uh, totally excited about the entire project, but I'm very especially excited about this uh, series uh, of talks that will begin now with uh, artist talks. And uh, it is uh, a great, great pleasure for, for, for me to, uh, to, uh, to have uh, Hans Ulrich and uh, Otto von Kanga in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, I don't think that uh, we need to introduce Hans Ulrich to the to the art world, but uh, I think uh, he's, uh, how can I put it, the interviewer par excellence, beyond many things. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a great honor for us when uh, Hans approached me and told me, oh, Koya, I really, really, really want to do these talks with, uh, with Otto Bong and with Gottfried and within the program that you're setting up at the fair. And uh, uh, thank you for that, because uh, it means a lot to us, it means a lot to the artists, it means a lot to 154. And I think that the discussion you will have will enlighten us even more about the work of uh, one of the most uh, outstanding, I, I don't know if I can say emerging, young or whatever, but one of the most striking and diverse uh, uh, contemporary artists coming out uh, coming out of Africa these days, which is uh, Ottobon Kanga. So, uh, before I talk too much, I just want to remind you: please put off your cell phones. It's really annoying to have phones ringing during the talk. So, because we are recording all this, and any ring really just destroys the whole project. And uh, when uh, the the part is on Q and A, please just. Uh, uh, just get up and say your name briefly uh, in order in order for for recording purposes and uh, at this point i think that the information didn't go through to everybody uh isa sam was supposed to have a book launch today or no tomorrow and that is cancelled because we incurred a lot of delays in the production of the book so that conversation and that book launch with uh, with uh, Issa Sam will not take place, just for you to know. Thank you. But I give it over to uh, Ose to introduce uh, Hans and uh, Otto Bon more in a more elaborated manner. Thank you. Um, and as Koye said, Hans certainly needs no introduction. Uh, Hans Ulrich is co-director of the Serpentine Gallery in London. Uh, he, in, in 2012, he curated uh, Jonas Mika's shows, Thomas Schutte, Figures and Faces, uh, Yoko Ono's show, uh, To the Light, um, and also at the Pavilion of Herzog de Meiro on Ai Weiwei and uh, the Memory Marathon. Um, his, recent his recent publications include A Brief History of Curating, um, Project Japan, uh, Metabolism Talks with Rem Kuhas and Ai Weiwei. Um, and then we have Otto Bong and Kanga. Uh, Otto Bong lives and works in Antwerp in Belgium and in Berlin, Germany. Um, in her work, uh, activities and performance uh, permeate all kinds of media and motivate photography. Her recent exhibitions include Play, Recapturing the Radical Imagination, um, and the Sharjah Biennale 2011, and also a sh show at Tate across the board 2013, and across the board at Tate, um, politics and rep representation. Uh, so could you please welcome Otto Bong and Kanga and Hans <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for these uh, wonderful introductions. And uh, indeed, it's an immense pleasure to be here with Ottobon today, we've uh, seen each other, of course, in Sharjah and um, uh, for the first time, and ever since in different cities. And uh, it was wonderful <coughs> because with Koyo we have this dialogue uh, for more than ten years. Uh, um, and when um, Koyo was mentioning this great initiative, uh, um, it's uh, wonderful that these interviews today can happen as a as a result. Mm -hmm. Now I thought because uh, Ottobon, you have images here, we can see, and um, <coughs> maybe we can you know, go through this, uh, it'll be interesting, obviously, to begin with the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and I was kind of very curious, what are your earliest inspirations 
to become an artist, if there was a sort of a sudden awakening or if it was a transitory process? Uh, no, no, not really. I mean, I think um, my family, if I start with my family, my mother and my, fa and my father, my mother, um, she was a French teacher and she had a lot of, we had a lot of books and a lot of things at home. Um, so she was very much open to us being what we wanted to be. And I remember at the age of 15, I said to my mom, okay, I want to make some money when I grow old. I don't think I'm going to do art. Even though I, I was making and drawing a lot, I enjoyed drawing. And when I was in school in Nigeria and Queens College, we were introduced to architecture. And my mother said to me, hey, you know, you can do architecture in art. You can do everything in art. And I was like, really? And she was like, yeah, I mean, why don't you just do art? If you do architecture, you would be a bit stiff. So I was like, oh, OK. And that's how it started, um, because I, I found my place of a place where I could hide, a place where I could, I found myself completely when I was alone drawing and, yeah, <coughs> making art. So it started with, uh, with drawing, and did you have uh, sort of inspirations or um, uh, artists who inspired you? Was that kind of encounter with uh, figures from the past? Yeah, um, uh, then at the age of 12, I think that was the big enlightenment. I was at the British School in Paris. Um, my mom was working in Paris at that time, and my art teacher, Mrs. Diana Shops, a British lady, she, um, in the art room, we had all these books, and I think one of the things that struck me the most was uh, Georges de Latour and also Caravaggio. So I was really impressed by the way the skills of like light, the, the obscura, the light and the yeah. dark, and, and also the way of like working with the skin. And, and then I started looking and we started going to museums and looking at work. So in the art room, I would just open art books and spend my lunch break looking at artworks, but the two people that I lo loved was Georges de Latour and also the Dutch school um, and the interiors of the Dutch houses mm -hmm. and the light that fell in through the windows, yeah. Now it's interesting also in terms of, uh, you know, this idea of figures from the past. I mean, it was Panofsky once said mm -hmm. that is um, uh, very often out of fragments from the past mm -hmm. that we invent the future and obviously for artists it can be a toolbox. Mm -hmm. Were there any, were the references mostly kind of European art or other arts, because I, I met in mm. Paris during my Paris years, I lived in Paris in the mm. 90s, and I met um, Ernest Mankoba, the great, you know, um, uh, South African pioneer of, mm. of, of modern art, and it was, you know, part of the Cobra mm. movement, and mm. Ernest Mankoba, you know, told me a lot about the whole uh, history of, you know, modernism in, mm. you know, in Africa. I was kind of wondering mm. if there were any inspirations from African yes, art on, on the work. Yes, definitely. Um, I think, si because at the age of 12, that's when you start dic discovering, and I was in Paris then. Later on, I went back to Nigeria, and I was in the university, and um, I actually put an image of someone that totally has shaped the way I have worked or how I look at things. And his name is Professor Agbo Folari. And when I was at the art school, I had many teachers. There was Lamidi Fakeye, the, a sculptor, very well-known uh, sculptor. Uh, and there were other teachers that were more or less just saying, well, today you have homework, you come back and you do this. But Agbo Folari was really special because that's how I discovered about African architecture, about African rocks, earth, he would take us, instead of having a class, you know, you know, inside the classroom, he would say, everybody out. And we would walk in the city of Ife, which is a cradle of Yoruba culture. And we would look at pebbles that were made by the Brazilian Yorubas. And when I went to Brazil, I found the same kind of pebbles stuck on the ground. Um, the way the architecture was made, and he would explain the religion at the same time explain the architecture, at the same time explain how the mod houses were made and why they were made and co climate control and African architectural, um, tropical architecture. So he was like the first person that actually made me understand that we were very much connected to the world, not only just we Africans in Africa, but there were a lot of things that happened 
that affected how we make things or how we look at things. And so that was something that has followed me with my work over, mm -hmm. the, over time, yeah. And where would you say, because <coughs> it's interesting always, I think, you know, where the catalogue resume mm. of an artist starts and, you know, thinking about Gerhard Richter, he once told me in the 60s, uh, the 60s, you know, he thought all of that is student work and then he started to number, mm. you know, that is where my work starts. Mm. Where would you say, did your student work end and your catalogue resume start? What is your number one in your catalogue resume? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I can't really say there is one thing but more an accumulation of things. I would say when I was at the Beaux-Arts in Paris that um, I, I was also going back to Nigeria at the same time. During the holidays, I would go to Nigeria and follow the courses in yeah. Nigeria with him. And so with the first work that I think that was really important for me was called Fattening Room. That was the first time I could relate to something of my culture, which, was the, which is the Bibio culture with the idea of fattening the woman to become beautiful. Um, and at the same time, looking at people like Fatih Hassan, um, Zaha Hadid, um, um, Demas Ngoko, different kinds of architects from the continent itself, and trying to understand what it is to find home. The idea of fattening, the idea of becoming someone else in the process, and so that, reflections that are taking place and the first work that I think ha has a very big impact for me is the work called Fattening Room which was made in 1999 and I was still in school. And do you have images of that? Or no, more because later work? Um, I have mainly the work of Shaja because yeah. I thought we'll be talking about that. I yeah. didn't put everything together. No, no, we can go fast track <laughs> to your early work and then see <laughs> and and that to Shaja. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you can then all you know see these images on the on the internet later. Yeah. But the thing is, I mean, one of the things I was wondering also is when then performance art entered because you know seeing your work in Sharjah, mm -hmm. uh, this sort of long duration performance. I was wondering, um, starting with drawing and then architecture, when or how you discovered that actually performance art is a form you wanted to explore, and if there was an epiphany for that or mm -hmm. a sort of a sudden. The, the performing arts, I mean, um, has always been there, uh, but I never considered it as performing arts. Yeah. I always tell people that w born in Nigeria, living in Nigeria, you, my, the performance is everywhere. That is my stage of, that's actually where I learned about performance, where you actually um, shift and become two persons at the same time, where you have to be immediately present, you have to be constantly present nine, from in the time you wake up till the time you sleep. Um, so it's a society that's already impregnated with that kind of energy that you have to be um, totally aware and awake. Uh, but later on, I think when I came to uh, Paris, I then realized that, oh, there is this thing called performance art. And for me, I just saw it like, well, it's something that should be, I didn't see it as anything special somehow. Um, but I realized that I could perform. I realized in church we sang, in the choir. Um, you, you're constantly performing, you're constantly. Um, but then to take it into an artistic level came in with the work of Fatney Room because the making of the photographic work at the end, the Fatney Room was a piece that was made out of um, mud, um, clay, and every day I built a ring around it, and then finally it was like a little hut, almost looking like the Meninas de Velasquez, and I was inspired from that. And then I sat, I put myself in it, and I made a costume, a very classical 18th century costume, and, and I performed for the camera person that would take the pictures, and they took over 80 pictures, and from those pictures I chose about 18 to make the final picture. So that was more or less the first time that I could mix my ideas of architecture, <coughs> sculpture, um, costume making into performance and finally into a photographic work. And listening to that, I was also wondering about the research because I read an interview with you the other day where you say that it's the quest to the unknown yes. that triggers your work and you very strongly research when creating work. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the research behind this project in art, but also other disciplines? Mm. Um, the research, I think that's very crucial. I think 
uh, today and today's time, it's not just enough to just make a work and then put it out there because people ask you questions. People interview you, people ask you, what are you doing, how are you doing this? And the research comes with also trying to understand myself, try to understand my background, where am I coming from, where am I going, how am I connected to the world, so that wherever I go, there is something, a place of interest, there's something that connects me, there's something that makes me understand why things are. And I think the more I dig, the more obscure it becomes, the more difficult and more, um, it shows other roots that I can't understand. But that for me is very exciting because the more I don't understand, the better it is. That means it gives me the possibility to insert my own fiction and my own way of like looking at things that have already been written by others, but sometimes not necessarily the truth. So um, the aspect of research comes with like finding my place within the things that I am, am involved in. So like for example, at the Weltkulturen Museum, I uh, worked behind the, I entered the collection of the museum and I specifically wanted to work with the African collection because we always say Africa, but it's huge. And already in Nigeria to already understand Igbos, Hausa, Yorubas, mm. uh, then the next thing we have to go to the uh, Senufos, Dif all those different cultures have very specific ways of making things and necessity of making things due to climate, due to the natural resources that they have there. So for me, I start understanding why certain things were made why certain um, situations are today, the political situations, the economical situations. And these are things that you know, indirectly and directly affect me. So however I'm going to position myself in the world, I need to understand where I'm coming from, one way or the other, to be able to position myself in the present. And when you do this research <coughs> for each piece and so on, so it's like, I can say, permanent research, mm. how does this produce archive? What's the notion? of archive in, in your work? Is there such a thing as a kind of an atlas, Gerhardt will call it an atlas, or is, is there a kind of a, an idea of, a, is it an image bank, or is it, uh, is it just, is your laptop your archive, or how? <laughs> there are different things that are archives. Um, they are stories that people tell. Um, so sometimes I film uh, people and they tell me a story about something. Uh, for example, at the Weltkultur Museum, there was a guy selling objects that were the same objects we could find them in the museum. And I filmed this guy and asked him about the objects, where he got it from. And the stories kind of give another narrative of how the, the, the parallel market happens in relation to how what happens in the museum. Um, there are other ways of archiving through drawings. I think drawing is a very crucial thing because sometimes I can't really put things in words like text. I like talking, but I don't like writing. I think my brain goes a bit too fast and my hands are too slow. Um, and drawing seems to be the best way to like throw out that. Images, also collection. I think, for example, what I did mainly when I was like in the year 2000, 2003, four, five, I was doing a lot of archiving through photography. So I went to Nigeria, all the different places I went to, I made a lot of photographic work. So the earlier works show like emptied remains, the work emptied remains or strip bare or road series, for me are more or less like archival and observatory work. Um, they're things that you, with your, with your camera, you take pictures, you really feel an emotion towards that space. And I showed them as photographic works, but they were more or less think, um, images to think with, mm -hmm. images to be able to process and to understand the acceleration of what's going on within the continent uh, because I'm not there and in many places I go to and sometimes I find incredible similarities. So the archive is on many levels and also with the body registering mm -hmm. certain things that are related to performance, working with other people, the body registers as, uh, and then that is also a kind of archive within myself. I can bring up, bring out that gesture when it's needed to come out. Yeah. The body as archive obviously brings us also to, to memory and uh, you mentioned memory in, mm. 
um, you know, some interviews and John Berger, you know, talks about the connection between drawing mm. and memory. Mm. Uh, Rem Kola says, you know, we think memory obviously is more memory in the digital age, but maybe it's actually the other way around. It's just kind of more and more information. Mm. And maybe amnesia is very much at the stake of the mm. digital age. And maybe that's the reason why memory is such an important topic in art mm. ever more so than ever before. Mm. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about about memory or that sort of whole idea of Eric Hobsbawm when he says a protest against forgetting. What's the kind of <laughs> role of the protest against forgetting in, in the practice? Um, it's a lot of things. I think one of the first things was being in school, in university in Nigeria, going to the library and trying to get a book to read about Nigerian artists or other artists or about the history of the country and, and realizing that the library has nothing. <laughs> has like a few books hanging in the shelves and you're in the, in the university and you're looking at the shelf and you can't find anything for research. And that really struck me already when I was at the age of 17 or mm. 16 that I was in the university, I couldn't find anything. So to be able to understand my the history or to be able to understand certain things that had happened before, it wasn't possible only through friends or families or, um, and then my, fa my own, f my mother, my father, they, they, they were deceased. So also my own family history also becomes very obscure. I can't get back certain stories or what happened before they got married or so for me that has always been there's always been a black hole somewhere of not understanding um, and also things that happen in your life your house gets burnt all the family photos from your childhood all gone except for one picture also the entire archive is the gone. entire archive so in 1977 our house got burnt and the only thing that came out of my, the house was my little brother. And everything else was erased. So I don't have pictures of my childhood. <coughs> I only have one picture that of my sister, my brother, and I. And there's one picture of my dad and my mom when they got married. And that's it. So to deal with that kind of, so the, the, pre, the thing of absence, of forgetting, amnesia, loss, memory, becomes very pregnant, becomes very um, real. And so I think with that, it's, it comes with also trying to understand your own process, trying to understand the past, trying to make, put a puzzle together. And, um, and I think with different works, for example, the work that I did in Belo Horizonte, um, State of Amnesia, and there was another work I did at uh, the first Biennale of Arts and Architecture um, in the Canary Islands that was State of Amnesia um, before, no, oh, I have to think about that title. Arresting the moment before the state of amnesia crops in. So it was really thinking of uh, looking at a landscape and looking at the space and trying to understand and trying to think, oh, would I remember the space when I leave? And I think also the idea of diaspora, moving out of the continent, coming into another space, you're constantly, your memory plays tricks on you. You come back, things change, nothing is static. And so these things heighten the way that I look at things and try to register or imagine or try to work with memory in a way that things are kept. But I don't want to keep them fixed. I want to reflect on them somehow. Yeah. And maybe that's a good moment to go to the images, images no? Images, yeah. Look at the <laughs> <laughs> Which has to do okay. with the memory of certain pieces. Yeah, I think um, this, uh, I'll just go through certain pieces. Um, because this piece, uh, I mean for Sharja, this was the first piece that I made um, in Charlottenburg, in the Kunsthalle Charlottenburg, and it was curated by uh, Charlotte Bronte and uh, Koya Kuo, and the exhibition was called Make Yourself at Home. Um, and one of the things I was really thinking of was the idea of stone, and stone is something that, has all, that is everywhere. 
that makes one feel comfortable. I realize that actually it makes me feel comfortable that I see sand, I see stones, I see plants, I hear birds, just the basic things of life. And so I decided to make a piece that, that had, um, these are prints on stone, digital prints on, on Galala stone, Egyptian flat stone. So when you look at it, you really think there is a stone, but actually there isn't. So it was also looking at the idea that something might, at the end of the day, when we dig through archeological things, we have this remains of something that tells us about the past. Um, and here it would be more or less, let's say a digital print of a stone of something that was of the past or that is of maybe a possible future. And here there are six tables with like po a poem and an image. And I think this one is called Protect. And it said, if my breasts were made of stone, I would walk around and feel something about being strong and because then my body can resist to whatever things that hit against it. Um, and it's obviously got to do with natural resources, I suppose. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because there's this great text, um, I read this morning, by Philippe Pirat, who really yes. talks about <laughs> your entire work, somehow connected, not to this yes. idea of natural, natural resources. Natural resources and excavations. And, but at the same time, I wanted to have a space where people can actually contemplate the materials that are in the space, the stones, the plants, which are epiphytons. These plants don't need any roots, but they can survive with humidity. And the ground is made out of gravel and magnetite, a kind of um, concrete thing used for concrete uh, building, making buildings, and it's quite heavy. And here you are ready because that's obviously the piece which anticipates Sharjah. Yes, totally. Because you had a similar kind of situation there. It was outdoors, it was yes. like a garden. Uh, but was here in 2010, was there already this long durational performance? There wasn't any performance. No performance the the idea of this piece was just to have two rooms where the people could actually relax, sit down in the exhibition, look at the work, read the poems, look at the images. Um, so uh, here there wasn't any idea at that point in time of performance, but people actually been performing in the space. Uh, and so when I came to Sharjah, um, and working with uh, Yuko Hasagewa, the curator, I found a space that was amazing because once I got into that space, it triggered a lot of things. It brought me back to my childhood, which is quite strange to be in the Emirates and then you're thinking, oh my God, I'm ho I feel like I'm home, <laughs> which has nothing to do with home. <laughs> Um, it was a, a magical courtyard. Yeah. Yes, it, it's, it was an amazing courtyard because it was the only courtyard that had a tree in the middle and had, because we had to look around the whole space to find, all the artists were shopping for a space. So we're like running and say, have you found a space? Yes, no. And then you run because you have to get the space before the other person. And when I found the space, <laughs> I told the girl, now let's go and see the curator, now. And 10 o'clock in the morning, we went to see Yuko. And I was like, Yuko, I found, I've fallen in love. And Yuko was like, in love? And I was like, yes, in love. I was like, in love with what? In love with the space. And then she was like, oh. And then I told her about the space. Oh, and she said, oh, that's my favorite space. So she said, you can have it. And then I was really happy because I already knew what I was going to do in that space. By just entering the space, I saw it. So. Um, but I did not know I'll do a performance. I just knew that it would be a place that I want to have as a place of contemplation. So when you look at this space, normally you just have a tree and you'd have bricks on the floor, like um, just normal bricks. And here I wanted to have, um, I went around the city of Sharjah and I asked, I looked at what was there and the white gravel comes from Oman and the rocks, the black rocks you have here they come from the Fujairah mountain. So I wanted things that were really locally found in Sharjah. And the other little blocks that you find here are stones that have been printed on. And as I started working, I mean, I had a general idea, but as I started working, I realized that this space actually makes me feel like I'm home. It's a Bahraini styled architecture <laughs> building, which is quite rare in Sharjah because most times they, they have more of Arabic but um, more Emirati kind of architecture or the glass buildings huge. But this one had a very special feel to it and it was taken already from the 19th century or 20th century. A very rich merchant made this house. And so I, I started 
thinking about the whole process of also displacing, moving from one place to another, having that feel of finding a place that makes you connect in a very strange way. And when I went to Sharjah in December, I started talking with the workers that are working there. Um, and because a lot of them come from Iran, Pakistani, um, India, and just to ask them, do they feel at home? How do they feel? And so from, and how are they connecting to this place? What makes them want to stay? Uh, so th a lot of the stories I got ended up as poems. So one of those poems is like, it's here, how did I come this way? Had I a choice, I let go by. Those fertile fields glit um, glittering bright and far in the night, needed but a hand to plow. Alas, broken and adrift, too old to fly or flee. And this was a story of an old man that I met working in a shop, and he didn't have enough money to go back, neither did he have enough strength to stay. So it was really, um, and also the glittering of Dubai and the lights, and they think you can make money, but not really. And so when we got there, it was like really strange, because I thought initially, that it was a situation which had always been there. It was that yes. sort of was magical because it was almost as found. And then I thought you would do this performance. And then I realized that you had actually brought all these materials yeah. there. And that then made me think of an earlier piece where you already moved sort of natural resources, which is this homage or this reference to Alan Capo. Mm. Um, uh, it's called Baggage from 2007. And it revisits the 72 happening actually of uh, Alan Carper, whom I used to know very well, I worked oh. with him on, you know, do it and instruction pieces of moving resources. Mm. And um, so you transport the bags of sand from a campus, actually, construction site to a beach um, in Galveston. Um, and, and, and so it was really a, a transfer of materials. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about this? It seems to be very interesting because here also you bring natural resources so, so, yeah. from one place. It's a dislocation of some mm. sort. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, baggage. Um, baggage was a very emotional piece. Uh, I, when I, I was asked, um, I think by Philip Pirot then, he was preparing the, um, the work on the enactments of Alan Capro or the re-interventions of Alan Capro. And he asked me, would I want to do, you know, look at one of his scores? And I said, well, well, let's look at it. I'm not sure if I'll do something with it. And going through all the scores, there was just one score that really touched me called Baggage. And that score was written in 1972. And he, he made that, he did the score with 20 of his students from the Rice University in the States. Um, and so I decided that I will then do this piece alone because actually Capro has never set his foot in any part of Africa. And I thought, well, since there's going to be a kind of collection of the work with his estate, it will be the first time to connect his work with my continent. So it was a way of like saying, okay, I'm going to do baggage. I'm going to take the sand, because the whole score was taking sand from, the, uh, from wherever you take sand. And then you, <laughs> you tag it with an owner's name, go to the airport, deliver it at the airport, pick it back up wrap it up, send it by DHL to the owners. And so for me, I thought, well, I'll use this way to like also think about the m movement of goods, how goods move from one place to another, but at the same time, how people are so restricted. We are e able to eat each other's kinds of food and material and use it in our phones. It's coming coltan from Congo, um, copper from here, that, and it's all mixed up with what we are every day and what we are using every day. But then as people to move, it becomes more and more difficult. So I thought I would just take the sand to Lagos. I picked the sand in Holland in three different places, had a bag, I went with, me, I went with it to Lagos. Through the airport, it went fine, I was a bit worried. I finally <laughs> dropped the sand in Lagos because the, it was quite hectic because of traffic, so it would take four hours, four or five hours. And um, sometimes I just had to try again the next day. Finally, the sa I got to the, be the beach, the sand went, poured the sand out, the water took it away, and then I brought it back by DHL. And the sand that was picked from Lagos, brought back by DHL, was then distributed um, in different performances and talks to people, because I believe that the owners is not just you, me, but it's everybody. 
So now the last 40 bags are left, but that will only be done back in Nigeria. So the, the work is being determined by the amount of sand that I brought back. Um, so it's more or less the end of the piece, but the last piece is reserved for people I love, and that would be done back home, more or less. So that idea of displacement, of movement, or being aware of what we're using, what we're working with, and maybe taking care of it somehow. So some people are taking care of my sand in their house at this point in time. And that idea of these resources, <laughs> I mean, there is another piece uh, which is the um, contained the measures of tangible, tangible memories, memories, where I saw images of it uh, mm. in 2009, mm. where you also actually have uh, uh, on these plinth all kinds of you know resources or materials mm. uh, and all of that. But what obviously happens here is that not only do you move these resources, but then this amazing live performance it happens. happens. Uh, and it's a very long durational piece. Uh, mm. And I was wondering, I mean, one of the things which is interesting is that one could actually come, because we then came back several hours later and it was still ongoing. So there's almost like this situation where throughout the opening hours, basically, yes. uh, it was there. So almost like uh, a living sculpture, as Gilbert and Charles would yes. call it. Um, uh, it's just that then once the museum closed or the exhibition closed, it was obviously gone. Yeah. Um, but um, what prompted that? Is it something you've experimented before? Is it the first sort of long durational piece you've done? No, the first long durational piece I think that had quite some public was at the Tate Modern, um, Tate Tanks, yes, Tate Britain, Tate Tanks, yes. And that was in November and that was a piece that called Contain Measures of Shifting States and four tables and I was one of the shifting states sitting around a table with 100 photographic images. And people that came into the Tate that day from 10 o'clock till 6 could actually sit with me and talk and discuss and look. And so we would be both changing each other's state by discussion. Um, because the idea of the work was about politics of representation. And I don't really believe in that idea of politics of representation, but politics of flux, of how things move from one to another. And we don't exist alone. We exist with other things and other people around us. And so here for this piece, this was, um, I think it came, I spent one month in Sharjah and everything there, even the plants, the papaya tree, the queen of the night, which is on my head, the mango tree, um, all that was found in Dubai. And, and also the little plants that we see in between the rocks here were mainly are from South Africa. So, and they're mainly tropical plants that need water, a lot of water. So it was also reflecting on this space in Sharjah of yeah. where water has to be used. And meanwhile, you don't have that resource, but you find ways of like going beyond the resource. A rare resource. I mean, I still don't really say water becoming this more and more rare resource <laughs> yeah, totally. in the 21st century. That's why Sildo says, you know, he drinks every day as much water as he can, because one day there might not be anymore. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that that was my already starting point of discovering these plants there. And these plants were also ch part of my childhood, like really the pa papaya tree in, behind the house, the mango tree next to the house, um, the queen of the night. Every night I smelled the flower at night. So when I found them, I was quite excited. It, that also tightened and shapen, shaped the work that I was going to do there. And so the performance came by just being with these plants. And then I realized that also at the same time, I was thinking of the courtyard as a place of narration, where as kids, we used to sit down and sing with my family. And when there's no light and when electricity has gone, you would sit there all night and sing in the dark. And so I, I thought it would be good to like share with people this moment of like feeling a sense of, of homeliness, a sense of, um, yeah, of sharing that moment of contemplation and that memory. So a lot of the stories were also research on the mango, where it came from, the mango tree, the papaya tree, how it moved, how did it come into Africa, because it was originally not there. And meanwhile, it's been adopted, and everyone says, oh, mango is from Africa, or papaya is from here. So it's like this kind of displacement and how you've kind of integrate. So the whole work was really thinking of 
very different poetic or different ways of like thinking of integration through plants, through stones, through all the elements that were picked from all the different parts of the world, coming together, plus people coming together and being part of a moment and part of a moment where we all are connected together at one point. Uh, it's scripted at all because I was yeah, wondering <laughs> because it's such a long piece if you had a, a, a really long script and to no. which extent improvisation entered. There was there were a few things that were scripted. That means yeah. the, all the research on the plants, the names of the plants, Sestrum uh, Nocturum and Nocturnium, um, uh, the history of the plant. All that was all researched on uh, Ratrayani for the Queen of the Night, the Queen of Jasmine. You know all the names, all these things were all researched, and that was all planned. Certain songs were planned, some songs that my mom sang as I was as a kid that made me really happy. Um, some things were really planned. Also, for each plate on the ground, there were names of things that I could then talk about. An air plant, what is an air plant? So I'll do all my research on the air plant. Um, but then the other parts were the improvisation with the public, where people had to vote, what would you want? Would you want a dance or song of the plant? That came through interact, interacting with people. Um, there are certain things that I didn't plan, and also when you get to a point of beyond where you can control your body, then I think at that point in time, you more or less feel the public going, coming in, and you, you can share a very intimate moment with a person because you feel this person, there is a kind of connection that is happening within the space. So not everything was planned. And of course, it's nine hours. I can't plan nine hours. Mm -hmm. I improvise nine hours. I, I work with others. I, I search for the strength of others to make it possible to move on. Now, one thing I'm interested in also in knowing more, which I wanted to ask you in Sharjah, but then we didn't have the occasion, so I wanted to ask you today, mm. is this idea that in your long durational piece, is like the piece you describe at the, you know, in the tanks, mm. at the Tate, or the piece in Sharjah, it's obviously you <coughs> performing mm. um, uh, with other people, but mm. mainly you performing, and you are present, the artist is present. Mm. Uh, now, there is with a lot of you know, long durational work, um, a notion of delegation or a notion of um, instruction where the artist basically can be an open scar, but where the artist basically takes on board, you know, other people and that's how the piece then can be there almost every, or can be there every day and museum mm. hours and that's, I mean, obviously something we've all experienced with, you know, pieces of, uh, of, uh, of Tino Segal, but mm, it's something yes. already mm. very early on, you know, for example, you have it in early Bruce Nauman pieces, mm -hmm. that possible loop that, yeah perform this piece can be there forever. Mm. Uh, and it's something which, for example, Ionesco, I, one of the, my earliest childhood memories, I met this you know, playwright, Eugene Ionesco, in the streets in Switzerland in a chat, and then he basically told me you know, that his play had been performed for more than 40 years, the bold you know, singer, La Conte Prichot, mm. every single night in Paris. So he said, you know, somehow it's almost as permanent, uh, it's probably more permanent than a public sculpture, which mm. has been removed after 10 years because mm. people didn't like it anymore. So it's always been there. So, and that obviously also worked only because, you know, he had written the play and then different people every night would, mm. uh, you know, would do the plays. So I was wondering um, <coughs> if that is something in your work, either present or potentially present, or if for you it is essential to be present yourself. Um, that's something that I've had uh, some issues with, how do you say, on how do you, how do you transmit knowledge of all what you've accumulated? Or because, for example, with the piece um, Contain Measures of Shifting States, I'm in there, I chose 100 photographic works, but I was thinking, what if that space is always shifting with different people? like uh, a neuroscientist to a botanist to, how would they interpret and the hundred images that are there? Would they have the possibility to discuss and to talk from their own point of view um, with people? So these are things that I'm trying to see like with the performance, I have my own knowledge, I have my own research, but I'm also interested in how can this be, how can this, be given out to someone else with a specific knowledge or a general knowledge or broad knowledge of things. And so these are things that I'm looking at to see how possible I can work with that. So far it's been very much coming from an inner 
um, uh, quests and inner research, but slowly and gradually, I think in the next piece I'm going to show now in Germany at the Maxim Gorky Theater, I'm going to be working with four dancers, and mm -hmm. here it's more or less, I, I give out the work for them to do it for four hours, and so we'll see how that works out. But in general, it's, it starts with really a hunger inside of me to, um, but I'm starting to look out to see, because then the question is, what happens after? What happens if something happens to you tomorrow? How does this work continue to live? Mm. How does it find a place where people can get that experience, but maybe not, the, it will never be the same, but a different experience. So I think the installations, I started making installations of works, and now I'm really thinking of installations, performance, and how to open it up on another level. But that's, that takes time. No, that's interesting, and it obviously means also that it can be both. It doesn't have to be an either or thing. I mean, yes. like as one could see in Klaus Biesenbach's, you know, the curated this uh, retrospective of Marina Abramovic, mm. and then you know there was her presence. The artist is the present, presence, yet at yeah. the same time, in the retrospective part, you had all these pieces mm. where other, you know, people actually um, read it, so yeah. as to say, the, the piece. So it can be can be both. But one of the things I was also curious is that in the earlier photo image, we had this handwriting, and when I arrived, one of the first things I saw, you know, was obviously this panel with the handwriting, and it's something which also appears in many of your drawings, the sort mm. of handwritten text. And um, Umberto Eco said the other day that, you know, handwriting is about to disappear, and if we speak to, like, you know, if we look at many teenagers now, they barely use handwriting, because obviously it happens all on a computer. There is a whole movement now to reintroduce handwriting into tablets so that maybe there's a new life for sort of handwriting, it doesn't disappear. Mm. What's the role of that sort of idea of, of handwriting in the, in the practice? Um, I think it just comes in very, like, uh, I'm not going to make anything big out of it. <laughs> but it's just the thing of, you can immediately erase, write, it's, 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 um, it's instant, it's there. It's, um, you just, like, I, I still, I have a diary I don't put anything on the computer. I write on my diary. If you look at it since 2010, you'd have every single thing. Wow. My budget, cost of work, people I work with, everything. Everything is organized. And it's all written, tipex written, drawn, everything. My doodling is there, ladies' faces. So it's just part of, I'm, I'm from a generation that wrote. The computer is a nuisance somehow. When I have to write an email, it's hell. <laughs> so um, excuse me those that send me emails and I don't reply. <laughs> but I like writing somehow. Um, so the writing in, in the performance for me comes very naturally. It's just something that I can, I feel it. Like I can write and I can erase it. Oh, I made a mistake. I can slow down a bit. It's almost like a drawing at the same time. So. Um, there is nothing special to it. It's just, it's just the way it is. Then one more question was, and I, we have to be, I think, watch out for time because I can only ask you a few more questions. I've got so many, but so this is maybe part one of yes. an ongoing interview, hopefully. <laughs> um, one of the things also, I felt it incredibly emotional, you know, entering this space. It was a very emotional moment, and that sort of the link, I think, between you and the audience in also other works can be very emotional. I was kind of wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and also how predictable for you are the reactions and you know, and if you expect a specific response and, and uh, yeah, and also you know, how you felt here in terms of mm. the response you got. Mm. Um, I don't expect anything. I, um, I think, like what I said earlier on, living in a society where you, as a kid or as a teenager, where every day surprises you. Um, living in Lagos, or whenever I go back, already at the, at the airport, you see people that are just like, <laughs> you came back from Europe, <laughs> it's hot here. <laughs> and, and you're like, oh. And then before you know it, the whole scenario, what you imagined the year before, is not the same. So I've learned not to underestimate or to take it for granted. People surprise. People still surprise me every day. Um, and I hope I will still be surprised. But I, 
I don't expect, I'm not, I don't plan it. I, I, what I want is mainly to transmit. And I think the first thing with performance is that you're able to transmit a certain kind of emotion. You're able to feel. You go to the opera, you go to a dance festival, you go wherever you go, you talk with someone. It's all about a hum humanity and about emotions. And so that is a very crucial thing. And when you, for me, I looked a lot also for the Shaja, this project, The Taste of a Stone, Ichad Esaufo, that's the video. Um, I looked very much at oral, oral history and um, narratives, looking at the griot, how does the griot um, tell the story within a society? How do people listen to this person each time, again and again, and still be taken, still be em um, empowered? How, how do orators talk and create a space where people can feel? Why do people vote for certain people? Why? What is it that makes you believe in something or believe in a moment? So these are the kind of things I was looking at and also be going to church or you know, you're in church or you go to places of parties or big mass parties, uh, there is an energy. How do you create that? Um, because the thing was quite complicated here because people could go out and come in constantly. So that means that the flux of energy is always shifting. So a lot of times it was constantly shifting in the space or refocusing on a group. And once a big group comes in, open up the performance. Um, Re-welcome again. Um, open up the whole piece, the body, everything. A song starts. That's how you can draw in someone into something else. So it was like looking at different um, strategies of like bringing in um, and also letting go somehow. Mm. Wonderful. Yes, I know we Time have to off. cut. I've got one last question. I need to ask you that question because my only recurrent question in all my interviews is a question about unrealized projects. It's, you know, we know not much about artists' unrealized projects and we know much more about architects' unrealized yes. projects because they publish them. Yes. And um, I was wondering if there are projects of yours which have been too big to be realized, too small to be realized. The other day I spoke to Doris Lessing mm -hmm. uh, and she was saying like, you know, they're not only the projects we couldn't do because they were too expensive or too big mm -hmm. or we didn't have time, but there are also the projects we, you know, maybe didn't dare to do. Maybe there's also such a thing as self-censorship, so that mm -hmm. would be another type of unrealized project. Oh, last but not least, you know, projects which were censored because mm. they couldn't happen. But can you mm. tell us about your favorite unrealized project? Well, I have one that is ongoing now. It's not unrealized. It's not yet started, but it will start. <laughs> but it's making me very excited. And since now I'm at the uh, day, uh, day, I was thinking a monument, a certain monument that relates the history of different places within the context of Germany. Yeah. But a monument work that could be part of a touristic guide, a monument that commemorates a certain kind of connection to, between the West and the South. Um, because a lot of times I go, the only places I would see anything that makes me so that connects me and says, oh yeah, you know, this, there was a history with the, with the West and with South and wherever, is ethnographic museums. Um, but you don't really see a scale, a monument that you go outside and everybody knows this monument is, tells a story about what happened in the past and the possibility of a possible future. I'm not going into de the details of it, but it's something that I feel like that enters more into political realms of like dealing with land and mapping a space within here. Great, Otto Bonk, thank you so very, very thank much. You. Thanks a lot. Thank you. 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 Thank you.